Can a bird sing only the song it knows? Or can it learn a new song? Said the lovely, lonely Lady Vampire, running the elegant scalpel of her fingernail along the bars of the cage in which her pet bird sang. My demented and atrocious ancestors habitually sequestered themselves from the light of the sun in solemn, indeed lugubrious, heavily curtained apartments. Each one, man or woman, was a victim of the most terrible passion. <gasps> Scarcely dare to speak its name. Even the meanest fiend in hell shuns the company of my kind. I am compelled to the repetition of their crimes. That is my life. I exist only as a compulsion. A compulsion. In Hungary, in the county of Temeswar, those who fall sick of the fatal lethargy that follows my embraces say that a white spectre follows them, sticking as close to their heels as does a shadow. They track down the dreaded vampire by means of the following ritual. They choose a young boy who is a pure maiden, that is to say, who has not yet known any woman, and set him there back on a stallion that has not mounted its first mare. The power of these two virgins exists, you understand, only in containment. Like me, like she, they possess the mysterious solitude of ambiguous states. They are not linked into the great chain of generation. We are all unnatural. Horse and rider trot towards the village cemetery and go in and out among the gravestones while the peasantry follow with spades and scythes and crucifixes and wreaths of garlic. Breathlessly they creep a little way behind the emissaries of virginity until... See! He stopped! He won't budge an inch! Here! Here in this vault beneath this stone the vampire lies! There the quarry lies, as ruddy in the cheeks as if I had nodded off to sleep in my shroud. I might have been taking a little after-dinner nap, replete, pacific. The priest takes up a heavy sword. <laughs> so they strike off my head. And out gushes warm torrents of rich red blood, like melted roses. The land is free from the plague of vampires! Oh. Endlessly, I attend my own obsequies. Softly, enormously, across all my funerals, my fatal shadow rises again. But love, true love, could free me from this treadmill this dreadful wheel of destiny. My daughter, the last of the line, through whom I now project a modest posthumous existence, believes herself to be a version of the Flying Dutchman, that she may be made whole by human feeling. But one fine day a young virgin will ride up to the castle door and restore her to humanity with a kiss from his pure, pale lip. Oh. Ah, my little girl, I would love to see you lie quiet. Night and silence. A bicycle is a solitary instrument. To ride a bicycle involves a continuous effort of will and hence is a moral exercise. I never guessed here in the Carpathians would be no stars. No stars, no moon. 
I am just a little nervous. Is it only a simple twanging of my own nerves that I feel? Yet I am not a timorous man. My colonel assures me that I have nerves of steel. And yet, I would almost be possessed by a strange conviction that terror itself was in some sense imminent in these particular rocks and bushes. I've never felt such apprehension in any other place. The northwest frontier, for instance, far more barren, far more inimical. But when they told me at the inn this morning that I should not stay out beyond the fall of darkness, I did not believe them. But I was not in the least afraid then. <gasps> oh. oh, nothing but a night bird. The cry of a night bird momentarily startled me so that I nearly fell. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Not a bird at the best of omens. To ride a bicycle is in itself some protection against the superstitious fears, since the bicycle is the product of pure reason applied to motion. And yet, like all the products of enlightened reason, the bicycle has a faint air of eccentricity about it. On two wheels in the land of the vampires, a suitable furlough for a member of the English middle classes. My first choice was the Sahara, but then I thought perhaps a more peopled tour would be more fascinating. Nobody is surprised to see me. They guess at once where I come from. The coarse peasants titter a little behind their hands. Le Monsieur Anglais. <laughs> but they behave with deference. For only a man with an empire on which the sun never sets to support him would ride a bicycle through this phantom haunted region. How dark it is. I perceive the terror inherent in this landscape as something external to myself. I perceive that this is a terrifying place, but I myself am not yet terrified. Not yet. Terrified. Now we approach a rustic bridge. And when he crossed the bridge, the phantoms came to meet him. English? Not one word. I say, where are you taking me? Ah, a light before us. We must be going towards that light. A light? A homestead in this abandoned and desolate region? Yet that light does not console me. It does not make me think of home and hearth and fireside. It is a sinister and flickering light, like marsh fire. Oh, by God, a castle with flambeau at the gates. A vast ruined castle, from whose tall black windows came no ray of light, and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line, like broken teeth. And at my gate I light the visitor a welcome with fire flowers plucked from hell. <laughs> where, are go where are you going? Oh, goodbye. Where are you? I am alone. Dear God. I never heard any portal close behind me with such an emphatic clang. What have we here? What apparition in black velvet? Ah, a valet by his obsequiousness. The Chatelaine's valet. Ah, he's gesturing towards me. Why, he's dumb. 
Uh, taking me off somewhere, are you? Off to meet the king of the castle? Ah! Uh, well, no need to clasp my wrist so tight. I'll come quietly. Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Ah, oh, it's only my pocket scotch humour that preserves my sanity. I am the lady of the castle. My name is Exile. My name is Anguish. My name is Longing. Far, far from the world on the windy crests of the mountain, I am kept in absolute seclusion. My time passes in an endless reverie, a perpetual swooning. I am both the Sleeping Beauty and the Enchanted Castle. The princess drowses in the castle of her flesh. Hush, hush, my dearie, don't distress yourself. Cold, so cold, Mrs. Bean. The wind creeps in through the cracks in the old stone and the fire never warms me. Now you just stop feeling sorry for yourself and eat up your egg. Look, I've cut up your bread and butter into soldiers for you. Oh, shall I eat up the nice soldiers? Like a good girl now. <gasps> your hands are like ice. Since a child, so cold, always cold, I should like to go to a land of perpetual summer and let the petals of a flowering tree fall upon my face as I lie in the warm shade and sleep without the fever of this eternal shivering. But could even the Italian summers warm me? And not all the fires of hell might do so. Countess, now just you stop your whining. Oh, shunned by fiends. Does my beautiful daughter sense her father's posthumous presence, or is she indeed a portion of myself? In the dark, luxurious room, I made out two figures beside the little fire. A craggy dame with pepper and salt hair dragged back in an austere bun, upright as a standing stone. And a young lady, seated. Good evening. Good evening to you. May I present you to the Countess? Oh, welcome, welcome to my castle. It's so lovely to see a new face. I rarely receive visitors and nothing, oh, nothing, I assure you, animates me half so much as the presence of a stranger. The castle is so lonely. Only the village people come here to bring milk and eggs and uh, a little fresh meat. Sometimes they bring me a benighted traveller if they should have happened to have stumbled across one. My castle is famed for its hospitality. <laughs> oh, you must forgive the shadows. My eyes. An affliction of the eyes. I can only see clearly in chiaroscuro, a condition my family shares with the cat. At first, in the heavily shaded lamplight, I could hardly make out her features, only her vague shape as it moved a little backwards, a little forwards in a bentwood rocking chair, inexorably as the pendulum of a giant clock. She wears a white muslin dress. She looks like a trapped cloud. But as I grew accustomed to the lack of illumination, I distinguished the shocking harmonies of her face. The young countess was so beautiful, she might just as well have been hunchbacked. Her beauty was so excessive, it seemed like a kind of deformity. Her beauty is a symptom of her disorder. There was about her not one of those touching little imperfections that reconcile us to the imperfection of the human condition. She would like very much to be human, but of course that is quite impossible. She is so beautiful. She is pitiful. Her stern, tartan governess has a mouth like a steel trap. My name is Mrs. Bean. Widowed early in life, in the most distressing circumstances, left to fend for myself in the wide world with only my five wits and moral fibre to aid me. I answered an advertisement in the Edinburgh Gazette for a governess to a young lady of aristocratic birth in a far corner of the Carpathians. They offered an unusually high salary, but my attention was particularly attracted by the fact that they offered to pay only the one-way fare, that is, the fare out. My interview took place one winter's evening in the drawing room of a luxurious suite at a sumptuous but discreet hotel. Only a little lamp glowed on the corner table, 
Yet, in order to shield his oversensitive eyes from even those few rays it emitted, the Count had donned a green eye shade. I was to learn that darkness was the exclusive element of this most unfortunate family. How pale his face was. Livid, I should say. Yet, the perfect gentleman. He offered me a chair. He treated me with the most extraordinary politeness. After a few preliminary inquiries, he asked me, did I know the Carpathians well? I answered with circumspection. I understand the air is clement and the mountains generally unfrequented. <laughs> Dark, scarcely tenanted forests, a peasantry rooted, rotted deep in the most degrading superstition, vile practices as old as the human race. Old up. In those rank villages, the devil himself dances in the graveyards on Walpurgisnacht, a bald mountain, a castle half in ruins. Had I, he asks, rather than an attraction for his phantom-haunted homeland, perhaps instead, personal reasons for choosing to exile myself so far away from Scotland, I thought then, oh, he must read the newspapers. Maybe he knows more about me than I well can. Sir, I must reluctantly confess that I do have personal reasons of the most uh, pressing nature for wishing to leave Scotland at the first opportunity. And destination, you might say, no object. My daughter, your charge, will not grow up to be as other women. Already, by an exquisite irony, she shows signs of unusual beauty, and yet her soul is already darkened by the knowledge of her fate. She is the last bud of a great tree of darkness, the final trial of the oldest, most deeply cursed line in all the fatal Balkans. Blood, blood, blood is her patrimony, Mrs. Bean. Father to son, mother to daughter, endlessly the taint leaks back in time. The silver bullet, the stake through the heart. <sighs> There's a little taint to every clan, sir. Nobody's perfect. To tell the truth, I guess there was a snag to the position you have vacant. Such a high salary. And a one-way ticket promised, only the one way. I'd no have answered it had I not been desperate. You see, my husband... Was recently executed. His crime... I'd never a notion as to the nature of his tastes. Married so young as I was. He's so cold to me. Then, that dreadful night when he came back from the graveyard with his fingernails full of earth and a bloated look about him. Blood well out, he said, and laughed like a hyena. Aptly enough. Necrophagy. Blood will out. The black ancestor of blood of Sonny Bean, who strewed the bitches outside Edinburgh with dead men's bones. <laughs> Times was hard. Sheep dying in the field for drought. The landlords grasping, bleeding as white with taxes. The corn took blight and rotted in the fields. The plague came, and hunger worse than plague. We poor folk dying for lack of a crust, ditches crammed with the corpses of the poor. So I says to my genie, the outlaw's life for us. And she says, aye, Sonny, let's eat them up the way they've eaten us. So Jeannie and I, she being great with child, took ourselves off to the seashore, and there we found a cave as high and wide and handsome as the mansion of the Chief Justice, and there we lived in comfort. And every passerby on the high road, first we killed him, then we robbed him, and then we ate him up! And we grew fat and prospered, 
and the Bernies came clustering about my genie's knee. Eight fine strapping sons and six wonderfully blooming daughters. We dressed in silks and satins, we pulled off dead bodies. Skin them alive, cried Jeannie. And oh, she was jewelled like a queen. We all the gems of the fine ladies, whose corpses we subsequently consumed with relish. For every night we dined off the fine flesh of earls, barons, marchionesses, and so on. The meat had the flavour of excellent pork, and you never saw such crackling. There's nothing to beat the rich flavour of a fat prelate's thigh baked in sea salt over a driftwood fire. But after five and twenty glorious years, the king's men came for us, and there was a mighty battle. We fought like tigers all day long, until the light began to fade, and then uh, their reinforcements came, and so they overwhelmed us. And I and my genie and the tribe that called me father were put to death in Edinburgh after amazing tortures. Amid scenes of wild rejoicing from the populace, but we'd eaten more of them than they ever killed of us. We preyed upon the masters like the wolves upon the flock, and so we had our furious triumph. the beans, the most insatiable hunger in the world. And so I came to take service with the Count, since I was not unfamiliar with the nature of the family passions. Oh, you'd never believe what a pretty wee thing she was, so trusting, how she would cling to me and beg to go out in the garden. Just this once, Mrs. Bean. Just this once before sunset. Wait till the dark, my pet, and then we'll venture out together just a wee way. <laughs> Her condition seemed to me a judgment passed on her long ago before she was born, my poor pretty dear my poor pretty i'm condemned to solitude and dark i do not mean to hurt you i do not want to cause you pain a magnificent apartment dark tapestries on the walls and a heavy scent of incense like a church or like a mortician's parlor such a fine throat mrs bean like a column of marble hush, hush child Calm yourself. My ancestors suffered very much from the direct rays of the sun and all lived all their lives in these solemn apartments, shaded from the daylight. Oh, so many centuries since one of my family saw the sunshine. I've never seen the sunshine. Though when I was little, I wanted to. When I try to do so now, I see only a kind of irradiated dark. On her knee, a fluffy kitten, and on the little table beside her, a jeweled cage. In the cage, her pretty bird. It's a skylark. Its element is mourning. But since I've kept it so long in my room, I think it must have grown blind because we keep the curtains drawn all day. You must not give way to self-pity. You are the way you are, a necessary creature of nature, and that's an end to it. Can a bird sing only the song it knows, or can it learn a new song? The Skylark song was written out for it when it was hatched, my dear, and without the intercession of, uh, well, let us call it grace, for the sake of argument, may not change its tune by so much as a single sharp or flat. 
a chignoned priest of the orthodox faith, staked me at a certain Slavonic crossroad in the year 1905. Dracula! So end all the line of Vlad the Impaler. My destination chose me before I was born. I exist only as a compulsion to repeat it. Have you come far today, young man? Oh, uh, from the village in the valley. I, I fear I can't pronounce it. How unexpected, how, how splendid to be amongst English speakers again. I so much wanted to give the peasants a message about my bicycle, but they couldn't make head nor tail of what I was saying, of course. Oh, please sit down there, in that deep armchair beside the fire. Be cosy, please. A tea? You're just in time for tea. Uh, will you take a little shortbread? Mrs Bean, my governess, makes it for me herself. Oh, shortbread? Mmm, how delicious. After the Gothic terrors of the early evening, now I find myself taking late tea in a cunning imitation of an Edinburgh drawing room at five o'clock on a November evening. And yet, when the Countess bites her shortbread biscuit, I see how curiously pointed her teeth are. Teeth too white, too delicate for human teeth. What little light there is in the room shines through her too white, too delicate fingers. What long, what pointed nails. How I'm shaking. Unease, disquiet. Fear? Yes, fear. But not yet. Quite terrified. Oh! Oh, Puss! What an unexpected honor for you. Puss scarcely ever takes to strangers. Oh, pretty pussy. Pretty pussy. I have two pets. My cat and my bird. And Mrs. Bean takes care of me. But most of the time I sleep. I sleep during the daytime. You've just caught me as I wake up. Usually I wake about nightfall. That's dawn for me. Ah, puss. I see you like having your ears tickled. <clears throat> what handsome family portraits? Among my terrible forebears, I number the Countess Elizabeth Bathory. They called her the Sanguinary Countess. She used to bathe in the blood of young girls to refresh her beauty. She believed these lustrations would keep old age at bay. Look, there's her portrait. Don't you see how little it is? All gilded. An abstract formalization of her rank rather than a description of her person, don't you think? That was the style of the time. She looks rather like an icon. It shows her looking in a mirror, do you see? But of course, she couldn't see her own reflection. She is peering and peering in the mirror for her face, but she will never find it. Never. Such solitude to live without one's own reflection. I continued to pet the kitten. Her loneliness always tormented her, and I could do nothing to console her, only try to convince her by my continual presence and my resolute inviolability that she was not indeed inimical to everything human. Although she'd been born with a full set of teeth, wisdom teeth and all, and every tooth most curiously pointed. <coughs> oh! Naughty pussy, naughty! <coughs> naughty, naughty! Like a great white bird, the girl swooped upon me. She, the Countess, you white night bird, you white butcher bird, spreading your wings, your muslin sails. She swept across the room to fall at my feet, pressing that delicate wet mouth to the juicy wound with, uh, such helpless greed. I felt the needles of her cannibal's teeth. I felt the suction of her tongue. <laughs> Countess, oh, but you are a naughty wee thing. 
The poor, pretty dear. She can't help it any more than the kitten could help it. I've grown used to it. At first, I could hardly bear it. Those night walks in the woods, she would bound off and come back in a little while with blood on her dress, making those faces she makes when she wants to cry but can't. Poor wee thing. She drinks as deeply as she can. Her face is contorted with avidity. Only now, clenched like a leech to my wrist, does she seem truly alive, truly present. She has come back from wherever it is she goes to and briefly possesses herself. Then I knew where the fear which inhabits these mountains makes its home. Here, in this perfumed boudoir, lodged in the frail flesh of this beautiful young girl. She drinks as deeply as she may. Then, fainting, slips onto the carpet. Oh. Lapsed into such torpor, mm. the Scotswoman can lift her in her arms as lightly as if the Countess were made all of rags. Mm. There. Ah, there, my dear. There, my precious. And I, dizzy, sick, can do nothing but clasp my scratched hand protectively with the whole one and gaze at the governess with the wide eyes of wonder. It is her passion. Such has been the dreadful passion of our house since Vlad the Impaler founded the line. Now she'll sleep a little. She'll return to her almost habitual trance. The valet will show you to your room. My bicycle. Oh, you're no be needing that. No, I fear you'll never leave the castle, young man. We'll send home to your folks that you met with an accident somewhere in the Carpathians. We've got it down to a fine art now, providing for her tastes, covering up the traces over and over again. We've done it over and over. Now you must rest in your room. I shall not wish you sweet dreams. When she feels the need, she'll come to you. There is no end to the ceaseless cortege of my hospitality. <laughs> Securely locked in, eh? A pleasant room. A good feather bed. Fine candelabra to light my hours of waiting. Oh, and a handsome portrait of Gilles de Ray over the fireplace, if you please. Are the whole damn clan related to every vampire that ever lived? A species of trance, of course. Interesting medical condition. I wonder what the sawbones back in London would make of it. Hematodipsia, the pathological thirst for blood. An exceedingly rare complaint. Now, where did I read about hematodipsia? And a touch of nervous hysteria, too. The young girl's disease. I wonder what that governess thinks she's up to. Feudal loyalty, I suppose. Stick to the line of Vlad the Impaler through thick and thin, no matter what. Even do the Countess's pimping for her in spite of her Edinburgh rectitude. <laughs> Seen queerer things on the Northwest Frontier, and that's the truth. All the same, a pretty pickle. And yet, what a lovely creature. Poor, reclusive girl with her weak eyes. And round about midnight, pale as water, stooping a little beneath her burden of old gilts, the beautiful somnambulist will turn the key in the door and come into my room on suave, silent feet. She will lay me down upon that narrow bed and feast upon me. Oh. And when I think of that, my shudder is not precisely one of pure terror. Although the rational bicycle rider at war with a pulsing virginal romantic in my heart tells me I must in my dealings with this lady. Beware, above all else, of masochism. Mrs. Bean. Just you lie quiet a while. Oh, Mrs. Bean. His kisses, his embraces. His head will fall back, his eyes roll, stark and dead. Poor bicyclist, he has paid the price of a night with the Countess. 
and some think it too high a fee, while some do not. I will say this, we shall have to get the kitten put down. She really gave the game away. Too soon, too soon. She can't resist it, can't resist it for one moment. The sight of blood produces a singular effect on the metabolism of us unfortunates. Not all the drams of paradise spread out upon a table could equal the atrocious appetite the tiniest bead of blood arouses in our febrile senses. Then, only then, do we wake from the curious kind of waking swoon that passes for consciousness amongst us. We seize upon the wound and worry it with our pointed teeth until the liquid life flows down our rabid gullets and torrents, floods. Drained, empty as a crushed grape, the victim drops to the floor. The wine skin of his body has been emptied, and we are fat and drunk upon his life. Elizabeth Bathory, known as the sanguinary countess, laved her white, exquisite body in the blood she tapped from the gross veins of the peasant girls, who had too much blood for their own requirements. So she kept her wrinkles at bay. She knew how much the preservation of her fabled beauty was worth. Her servants never betrayed her, in spite of torture. They were in such deep complicity with her, they urged her to renewed infamies as though her beauty and wickedness were properties of themselves. And the more beautiful and wicked she became, the more they too were enhanced. The young girls who became me when they washed me with my awful sponges were as much my victims as those whom I immolated. Yet only in their admiring faces could I see the wonderful results of my magic baths, for my piercing eye had broken every mirror in the castle. When I looked at them, I saw how wonderful I was and how terrifying. If they had ceased to be afraid of me, I would have ceased immediately to be beautiful. I was a great lady and my portrait shows me crusted almost entirely in gold. She stares. How handsome he is. How the little pulse in his white throat throbs. First, I was content with rabbits or lambs. Then one night, walking in the churchyard, my very sensitive nostrils twitched to sniff the fragrance of a new grave. Rising from her catafalque, the countess wraps her negligee about her. So delicate and damned, poor wee thing, quite damned. Only my bread in the bone, good old Scots hypocrisy, keeps me in my position without loss of moral face. I'm secure in my own salvation. I can't alter her destination one little jot. Hell's her destination. All roads lead her there. So off you go, my pet, and play. One by one, I shall blow out the candles for her. The little flames flicker, and one by one go out. Midnight strikes. Only the last little candle left alight. Now bending, dimming, yet still not extinguished. I do think me lady comes. A waft of cold air, like a blast from a freshly opened grave, comes into the room with her. She brings this cold wind in her hair, her garments. The final little flame is reflected in those woundable eyes, shows them rolled upwards, fixed. She does not see the light. I think that now she sees nothing. But her nostrils faintly quiver, so beautiful so touching in her blood-stained negligee of very rare precious lace. She smells the blood of an Englishman, ye kin. 
Her wee nose goes twitch, twitch, twitch. Into the world she slipped through one of the interstices between reality and imagination. Even the vilest fiends in hell shun the company of the vampire. Who is dead, yet not dead. Whose bane is an insatiable thirst for life, and yet an inability to live. Grinning, she lunged towards me. <sighs> ah! Claws and teeth sharpened on several centuries of corpses. Sick him, girl, sick. <laughs> <laughs> Swiftly, I sidestepped her embrace and caught her by her slender wrist. <laughs> How we struggled. Her strength was more than human, but at last I flung her upon my narrow bed and slapped her face once on each cheek, the remedy for hysteria. Although it went against the grain to strike a woman. What? Strike her? Raise your hand to my daughter? to the heiress of the regions of ultimate darkness. The shock did indeed break her trance. Her shoulders quaked. Slowly, slowly, she raised her head and turned those eyes the shape of tears laid on their sides towards me. Her features twisted. Although her eyes were shaped like tears, she could not weep. Nevertheless, she continued to try to do so. Perhaps her whole life had been a balked attempt at crying. I am not a demon. For a demon is incorporeal, nor a phantom, for phantoms are intangible. I have a shape. It is my own shape. But I am not alive, and so I cannot die. I need your life to sustain this physical show myself. Please, give it to me. Her rich lips part. She smiles. She raises herself. She beckons. I felt myself seized by the most powerful erotic attraction. Only the exercise of iron self-control prevented me from throwing myself at her little feet. Yet I, who love the bicycle and the light of common day, cannot in the final analysis bring myself to partake in this grisly charade. My reason forbids it. My life depends on yours. I am a woman, young and beautiful. Come to me. And so she folds herself upon the bed with the lace falling about her softly and stretches out her white arms to me. Hmm? Her long hands with those fingernails like mandolin picks. I blessed the cold showers of my celibacy. Countess, keep your talons to yourself. Oh. When I held her wrists together to keep her murderous hands away from me, she made her weeping face and writhed a little, for she was thwarted, poor, spoiled child. Mm. When I first saw you tonight, I thought you were an infinitely pitiable creature because of your beauty and your loneliness. Curious. Oh. Now she seems to wake. Her eyes clear. They settle upon him. How pure and pale his lips are. Lips that have never, oh, never, oh, can it be? My father loved me and brought me Mrs. Bean over the sea from Scotland to look after me. He taught me how to suck the blood from the young rabbits and crunch so deliciously their little bones as we crouched in the moist undergrowth of the thickets by the churchyard. But I grew up. And then I was not satisfied with the rabbits and the baby lambs and little calves still wobbling on their newborn legs. No. Now I must have men. And so they come, but never go. All dead. All dead. I know I only lodge within my body. I am I, and yet not I as if I haunted my own shape and am condemned to watch with shame and rage its beastly doings. Oh, look. She is trying to cry again. My kids' relations with my kind exiles me from daylight. I am a creature of the night only. I belong to the night. 
One thin, wandering hand nuzzles the ribbons of her negligee. She slips succinctly from the garment and relapses upon the coverlet in the most alluring abandon. In my head, I hear all the string orchestras of seduction playing at once together. So she voluptuously invites me to step into Juliet's tomb. And I was foolish enough in my rationality to set out upon a bicycle tour of the Carpathians with none of the traditional impedimenta of the vampire hunter about me. No wreath of garlic, no silver bullet. But only the conviction that this is a poor, sick girl maintains me in the perpendicular stance of reason when common sense tells me the best thing to do in the circumstances is to fling myself helplessly upon her. We should take you away to Vienna, where you could stretch out on the therapeutic couch, and the stern, quiet, bearded physician would tease from you during the slow intervals of healing time the confused origins of your sickness. Why aren't you afraid of me? Why don't you shrink from my murderous fingers? Oh, what can your governess be thinking of never to have cut your nails? You fine lady, with your Strawwell Peter's hands. They cripple the feet of Chinese women as a sign of status. It's the same with me. I may not use my hands as hands. Three inches of horn stick out at the tips, don't you see? Useless for anything but gouging. With an infinitely touching gesture, she tucked her hands away behind her back, as though she were ashamed of them, and smiled at me. Tremulously. My daughter, oh my daughter, am I losing you? With no thought of passion, heaven forbid, only of consolation, I took her in my arms. <gasps> how warm you are, how you warm me. I find it difficult to breathe, my little girl. Don't you remember me? Don't you remember sucking the delicious bones of the baby rabbits? I never in all my life felt warm till now. She leans her head upon my shoulder with the most moving simplicity. And I gently stroke her disordered hair. If I sang you my Liebestot, you would not understand it. <laughs> I never liked Wagner. Heavy, decadent stuff. Do you think you could sleep now, my dear? Choking, airless. She's rich enough to pay for treatment in all conscience. Oh, the poor girl, a ghastly affliction. I feel almost a healthy sleepiness come upon me. Will you, would you, could you give me a good night kiss? Oh. I was infinitely moved. Softly, with my lips, I touched her forehead as if I had been kissing a child goodnight. His pure, pale lips on your brow. Ah, fall upon me all at once, the consecrated sword, the pointed stake. Ah. I always knew that love, true love, would kill me. She felt quite limp in my arms, as if after the crisis of a fever. Soon it will be morning. The crowing of the mundane cock and the first light will dissolve this gothic dream with the solvent of the natural. Yes, perhaps I shall take her to Vienna, and we shall clip off her fingernails and take her to a good dentist to deal with her fangs. Perhaps, perhaps, one day when she is cured. Mother, I want you to meet. In a millennia of beastliness to expire upon a kiss. There are some things that even if they are true, we must not believe them. I existed only as a symbolic formula. I was a woman. Young and beautiful. A little curl dangles over her forehead and moves with her breathing. Sweet, so sweet. Oh, 
I don't believe your silly tale. Just the hysteria of a young girl in this isolated place at the back of beyond with only the family portraits for company. Look, now she sleeps deeply. Oh, could do with a spot of shut eye myself. Been a heavy day. <laughs> when I awoke, refreshed, I found I was clasping in my arms only a white lace negligee, a little soiled with blood as it might be from a woman's menses. Fly away, Barney. Fly away. Why, Mrs. Bean, you've opened up the curtains. My goodness, what a view. <laughs> Let a breath of fresh air into this mausoleum. A glorious morning. I sent a man to look after your bicycle. You'll be wanting to get on with your tour after you've had your breakfast. The Countess is... Ah, well, I regret most bitterly you should have visited us at a time of mourning. The last of the line, you understand. They'll say a mass for her in the chapel. I myself, being a free thinker, will not attend. I am well provided for in the will, of course. I shall return to Scotland as soon as the estate has been wound up and opened a girl's finishing school, perhaps, or a boarding house. Not a mutton pie shop, you'll be glad to hear. May I see? In the last repose of death, she looked a little older, but not much. A good deal uglier since she had lost all her teeth. And because of her loss of allure, at the first time, fully human. So I sped through the purged and rational splendors of the morning. But when I arrived at Bucharest, I learned of the assassination at Sarajevo and returned to England immediately to rejoin my regiment. The shadow of the fatal count rises over every bloody battlefield. Everywhere I am struck down, everywhere I celebrate my perennial resurrection. <laughs> <laughs>